Welcome to Water in the West, an ecowest.org presentation. ECOWEST's mission is to inform and advance conservation in the American West by analyzing, visualizing, and sharing data on environmental trends. This is one of six presentations that illustrate key environmental metrics. Libraries for each of these topics contain additional slides. You can download all this material at ecowest.org. Let's begin with a summary of this presentation. The American West is facing a water crisis that is being compounded by population growth and climate change. In most parts of the West, water is an especially scarce resource. The 11 coterminous western states average just 18 inches of precipitation per year, compared to 37 inches for the United States as a whole. Scientists believe climate change will make the southwest even drier and shrink the snowpack in many locations. Although overall water use has leveled off over the past few decades, total municipal demand is increasing as cities continue to grow. Laws like the Clean Water Act have reduced pollution and western streams tend to have better water quality than those in other regions, but lakes are in poorer condition. Nutrient loading and degraded lakeshore habitat pose the greatest threats in the west. The nation's water infrastructure is crumbling, with hundreds of billions of dollars required to fix dams, levees, sewage plants, and drinking water systems. Looking ahead, proposed water management strategies include water conservation, water reuse, reforms to state water laws, expanded water markets, and desalination. Breaking down the complex issue of water in the West is a task unto itself, and in this presentation we've organized the metrics into six broad categories. We begin by discussing the West water supply, how it is naturally limited, how climate change will continue to alter precipitation patterns, and what this all means for the West streams, rivers, and reservoirs. Next, we discuss the demand for water, what sectors and users consume and withdraw the most water in the U.S. and the West. Where is there increasing conflict? The following section discusses water quality in streams, lakes, and our drinking water. Our focus then shifts to the West's aquatic and riparian habitats and some of the threats to native biodiversity in freshwater systems. We provide a brief discussion of the state of our nation's waterworks and the steep repair bill facing utilities across the nation. Finally, we outline some potential solutions, conserving water and using it more efficiently, using markets to reallocate the supply, and tapping the ocean through desalination. Let's begin by discussing the West's water supply, where our water comes from, and how those sources may change in the future. Climate change is expected to make the southwest drier, and while precipitation is projected to increase in the Pacific Northwest, it will be more likely to fall as rain than snow, causing major changes to the runoff that feeds western rivers. Water abounds on Earth, but our fresh water supply is extremely limited. These bars illustrate Earth's total water distribution. About 97% of all water is in the oceans, with fresh water comprising just 2.5% of total water supply. The majority of this fresh water is locked up in glaciers and ice caps with most of the remaining fresh water found below our feet as groundwater. Surface and other fresh water, including ice, snow, lakes, and rivers, make up a very small fraction of total fresh water. Water is an especially scarce resource in the West. This map shows annual average precipitation from 1971 to 2000. As you move from east to west, the climate gets noticeably drier, with the exception of the Pacific Northwest. In the 11 contiguous western states, annual average precipitation is just 18 inches, while the U.S. average is 37 inches. So how does the west precipitation compare with the rest of the country? This graphic displays the states with the highest and lowest number of rainy days. At the extremes, New Hampshire sees the most rainy days, while Arizona sees the fewest. Not surprisingly, several western states, including Nevada, California, New Mexico, and Colorado, have the lowest number of rainy days. Parts of the west have become even drier over the past 50 years. 
From 1959 to 2008, U.S. annual average precipitation increased about 5%. However, many areas in the West and Southeast experienced a decrease in annual precipitation. Arizona and the Pacific Northwest, for example, have become noticeably drier. Changes in precipitation are connected to patterns of drought, with some parts of the West experiencing more droughts over time and others less. This map shows trends in end-of-summer drought as measured by the Palmer Drought Severity Index from 1958 to 2007. Hatch marks indicate areas where major trends have occurred. In the West, drought has been on the increase in more areas than it has been on the decline. By contrast, drought in the Northeast has become less common. Looking ahead, precipitation is projected to decrease in many regions of the West. This map focuses on the period between 2020 and 2039, not far off from today, and it shows a projected decrease in precipitation for large portions of California, Nevada, Utah, and Oregon, and virtually all of Arizona and New Mexico. Regions at lower latitudes, in particular, are expected to get drier, while the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies are projected to get wetter. Climate models using a high emission scenario for greenhouse gases predict that in the winter and spring northern areas are likely to get wetter, while southern areas are expected to get drier. In summer, most regions of the U.S. are expected to get drier. There is less certainty on exactly where the transition between wetter and drier areas will occur, but the hatched areas indicate where confidence is highest. Add it all up and we're expecting to see pretty significant declines in runoff, which is the melting snowpack and rainfall that flows into streams, rivers, reservoirs, and the ocean. This map shows projected changes in median runoff for 2041 to 2060 relative to a baseline of 1901 to 1970. Hatched areas indicate greater confidence due to strong agreement among model projections, while white areas indicate divergence among model projections. We can see that a 10 to 20 percent decline in runoff is expected throughout California, the Great Basin, and the Upper Colorado River, as well as along the Rio Grande. The west snowpack and the timing of the spring and summer snowmelt are critical ingredients in the region's water supply. For many rivers in the west, spring and summer runoff contributes 50 to 80 percent of the annual flow. The timing of the snowmelt discharge ranges from as early as February in some of the rivers along the Pacific coast to as late as June for rivers in the Rocky Mountains. Over the next 30 years, however, the surge of snowmelt that feeds western rivers is expected to come much earlier. This map shows the projected change in peak snowmelt timing from 1975 to 2040 by freshwater ecoregion. These changes in snowmelt timing mean that peak stream flow will also occur earlier. This map shows projected changes in snowmelt driven streams by 2080 to 2099 compared to 1951 to 1980 under a higher emission scenario for greenhouse gases. An earlier snowmelt runoff poses difficulties for water supply management and ecosystem health. Dam managers, for example, will have to alter their operations, and species will have to adapt to new seasonal patterns. We know that the supply of water is naturally limited in most parts of the West, and that there aren't many sources that haven't been tapped yet. But where does all that water go? In this section we discuss water demand and the changing patterns in how we use water in the West. Irrigation remains the top water user in the West, but municipal demand is increasing as cities grow. The energy sector is a major water user, and plenty of energy is also required to pump, move, and treat water. When examining water use, it's important to distinguish withdrawals from consumption. Water withdrawals refer to water diverted from a surface water or groundwater source. In many cases, water withdrawals are returned to the environment for future use. Consumptive water use, on the other hand, refers to water that is permanently removed from its source. In other words, water that is no longer available because it has been evaporated, been incorporated into products or crops, uh, it's been consumed by people or livestock, or otherwise been removed from the immediate water environment.
This distinction becomes especially important when examining water use by thermoelectric power plants. While power plants account for 39% of all withdrawals, they consume just 3% of all the water. Nationally, irrigation for agriculture accounts for 85% of consumptive water use. Between 1950 and 1980, water use in the United States steadily increased. During this time, the expectation was that population growth would continue to drive an increase in water withdrawals, but the level declined shortly after 1985 and has remained relatively stable despite a growing population. One reason the overall per capita rate has been steady is that power plants have shifted to recirculating technologies that withdraw less water. There have also been gains as farmers have shifted from flood to sprinkler irrigation. If you look at just domestic use, the per capita rate declined slightly from 101 gallons a day in 1995 to 99 in 2005, but the rate varied from 51 gallons a day in Maine to 189 in Nevada. This chart depicts total water withdrawals in the United States by water use from 1950 to 2005. You can see that thermoelectric power withdraws more water than any other use with irrigation in a close second. Overall withdrawals peaked in 1980 and have been hovering around 400 billion gallons a day over the past 25 years. This graph displays the same water data as the previous slide, but it removes thermoelectric power and irrigation. While total withdrawals for most uses have leveled off, there's been a steady increase in water use for public supplies, basically utilities delivering water to homes and businesses. In fact, public supply withdrawals more than tripled during this 50-year period and increased about 2% 2 from 2000 to 2005. This increase reflects the trend toward urbanization over the last 50 years. The percentage of the population served by public suppliers increased from 62% in 1950 to 86% in 2005. Focusing on the West, we see that irrigation accounts for the vast majority of withdrawals. Irrigation has been by far the largest water user since USGS began collecting this data in 1950. In 2005, the majority of withdrawals and irrigated acres were in the 17 coterminous western states. California, Idaho, Colorado, and Montana accounted for 49% of the total water withdrawals for irrigation and 64% of surface water irrigation withdrawals. Similarly, many western states were also the top groundwater users in 2005. The top three consumers of water for agriculture, California, Idaho, and Colorado, were also among the states consuming the most groundwater. While surface water withdrawals have leveled off over the past half century, USGS data shows some increase in the use of groundwater since 1950. So what do the West's water use trends mean for the future availability of water? This map displays water availability by ecoregion based on the ratio of runoff to water use, essentially the supply of surface water versus the demand for those resources. Now this calculation doesn't account for the use of water from some other sources, including groundwater, desalination, and the reuse of wastewater. Nevertheless, huge regions in the West are classified as having some degree of water stress, with the most threatening imbalances occurring in southern Arizona, central and northern California, Nevada, and the western high plains. Another factor increasing western water demand, and particularly demand for public supply, is population growth. This map shows projected population growth from 2000 to 2050. Many counties in the West are expected to experience significant growth, with population doubling in many parts of California, Arizona, and Nevada. With increasing demand and decreasing supply, water conflicts are expected to multiply in the coming years. This map from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation shows regions in the West where water supply conflicts are likely to occur by 2025. The assessment was based on a combination of factors, including population trends and endangered species water needs. The red zones are where conflicts are most likely to occur, 
Areas where the potential for conflict is greatest include the San Joaquin River and Bay Delta in California, the Great Salt Lake area in Utah, the Lower Colorado River, the Muggy on Rim area of Arizona, the Rio Grande, and the Colorado Front Range. Let's move on from water supply and demand to talk about the quality of our water. In general, water quality is improved in the United States thanks to laws like the Clean Water Act. We no longer have rivers on fire, and we generally don't dump raw sewage into streams anymore. But measuring the quality of the West water is actually somewhat difficult, because there aren't a lot of good sources of high-level data. But here's what we found. While the EPA and USGS closely monitor water quality at a watershed level, inconsistent reporting standards have led to a dearth of information on quality trends in the United States. In an attempt to fill this gap, the EPA in 2006 launched the National Aquatic Resource Survey, basically an examination of the nation's streams, lakes, coastal areas, and wetlands. The map above displays the three major regions for which the EPA studies have aggregated the data. The Eastern Highlands, the Plains and Lowlands, and the West. Of the three major regions examined in the EPA study, the West was in the best biological condition, with 45% of streams rated good. For its assessment of water quality in lakes, the EPA reported data for nine regions. In the west, these include the drier Zurich region, which is displayed in orange, and the western mountains, displayed in green. The Zurich region includes the flat to rolling topography of the Columbia Snake River Plateau, the Great Basin, Death Valley, and the canyons, cliffs, buttes, and mesas of the Colorado Plateau. While the majority of the nation's lakes and the lakes in the western mountains are relatively healthy, nearly half of the lakes in the Zurich region are in poor condition. This graphic illustrates key stressors affecting the biological condition of lakes. Specifically, it shows the proportion of poor biological conditions that could be improved if a stressor were eliminated. Nationally, the most widespread stressors are those that affect the shoreline and shallow water areas, which in turn can affect biological condition. The most widespread of these is the alteration of lakeshore habitat, measured by the amount and type of shoreline vegetation. We have another presentation available on ecowest.org that explores the biodiversity of the West and discusses both aquatic and riparian ecosystems. But here we offer a couple of summary slides on freshwater habitat in the region. This close-up of the West shows its two dozen or so freshwater ecoregions as defined by the Nature Conservancy. This is the unit of analysis we'll be using in the next few slides. The geographic definitions of freshwater ecoregions don't always line up with the boundaries of river basins. The Colorado River Basin, for example, includes the Colorado, Bonneville, Vegas Virgin, and Gila freshwater regions. One measure of biological diversity is the number of endemic species that are found in a given location but nowhere else on the planet. In the United States, freshwater endemism is greatest in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. Out west, hotspots include California, Oregon, Utah, and Arizona. In the United States, most areas have between four and eight freshwater mammal species, but there are upwards of 20 in the Pacific Northwest, parts of the Midwest, and along the eastern seaboard. Texas is the state with the most freshwater bird species, but at least 60 species are found in nearly every part of the country. The southeast United States has the greatest number of amphibian species and an especially large number of salamanders. There aren't as many amphibians out west, but there are still plenty even places that are not especially wet, such as the Colorado Plateau and Mojave Desert. Texas has the most threatened amphibians. There are three to seven such species in California, Oregon, and the Four Corners states. 
This map illustrates the number of fish species by freshwater ecoregion. Areas around the Mississippi River and its tributaries harbor the most freshwater fish species, in some cases five times as many as in western ecoregions. If we're looking at the number of migratory fish species, however, the Pacific Northwest has a relatively high diversity. In the United States, which has nearly 80,000 dams, virtually all ecoregions have seen their fish runs significantly disrupted, making it impossible for some species to follow their natural movement patterns. In the West, the problem is especially serious along the Columbia and Colorado rivers, both of which have major hydroelectric dams. Harmful invasive species are present throughout the country, with the greatest number found around the Great Lakes and in the Northeast. The nation's waterworks, its dams, levees, aqueducts, sewage treatment plants, have come a long way over the past century. They're a major reason why we've been able to settle arid parts of the West and clean up many rivers and streams. But as with the rest of the country's infrastructure, many elements are in disrepair. Fixing the nation's waterworks will cost tens of billions of dollars. Put simply, our nation's infrastructure is crumbling. When engineers grade the various sectors of infrastructure, none of them do very well. But elements of our waterworks, dams, levees, and sewage plants, score particularly poorly. The American Society of Civil Engineers projects that we will need an additional $108 billion over the next five years in order to comply with existing and future federal regulations for drinking water and wastewater. Looking at the investments needed to improve water infrastructure, California comes out on top for both drinking and wastewater systems. Dams in the southwestern states are most in need of repairs. The blue bars show the number of dams in need of rehabilitation in each state, and the orange squares show the percentage of each state's dams that need this work. Rising infrastructure costs are a major reason why water prices are continuing to climb. This graphic shows that water bills increased faster than natural gas or electricity costs for American consumers between 2000 and 2012. Many experts believe that water rates will continue going up in the West as utilities struggle to find new supplies in response to the increasing demands of a growing population. Higher water prices could also make conservation measures more attractive to individuals, businesses, and water providers. In this final section, we discuss some water management strategies that are meant to address the crisis of water in the West, as well as elsewhere. This isn't an exhaustive list, but these three strategies are among the most important. Number one, conserving water and using it more efficiently. Number two, using marketing to transfer water from low to high value uses. And three, desalination of seawater to create new potable supplies. Let's start with conservation. As we saw earlier, irrigation uses the vast majority of water in the West. For that reason, many researchers and nonprofit organizations have focused on ways to increase water efficiency in agriculture. This graphic shows some of the possible conservation strategies and how they measure up compared to fallowing the land or retiring it from agriculture. Municipal water use has been growing faster than other sectors, so when it comes to conservation, it also makes sense to focus on water use in the home and businesses. In the U.S., household water use averaged 172 gallons per person per day in 2005. Nearly 60% of water use occurred outside of the home, watering lawns, irrigating landscaping, washing cars, filling pools, and the like. Inside the home, Toilets consume about one quarter of all water. Clothes washers consume about one fifth. It's also important to note that leaks account for 14% of all water use. Another opportunity is the use of gray water or recycled water that's used twice in the home. Water from baths, showers, and clothes washers can be used for outdoor irrigation, thereby reducing a household's overall demand. 
This graphic shows that gray water accounts for an average of 40% of the water used by residents in 12 North American cities. There's also another category known as black water that includes water from dishwashers and toilets, but that source is too contaminated for immediate use outdoors. On a larger scale, many municipalities in the southwest reuse their effluent to irrigate turf, and some are considering treating the sewage to drinking water standards and delivering it to customers. Inside the home, a typical homeowner can reduce water consumption by about 30% by implementing conservation measures, such as installing more efficient fixtures and checking for leaks, to say nothing of the savings associated with behavior changes, such as taking shorter showers. On average, it costs more to conserve water through audits, device giveaways, washing machine rebates, and landscape conversion than through other conservation measures, such as progressive rate structures and ordinances. Toilet distribution programs showed the highest savings per participant on average, and the highest persistence in water savings of all of the programs analyzed. Let's move on to another potential solution to the imbalance between water supply and demand in the West. Shifting water uses among sectors, especially from low-value agricultural uses to cities. Water markets exist where water users voluntarily agree to buy or sell access to new supplies. These sorts of transfers have been taking place for years, and the majority is contracted under short-term leases. Water sales, or the permanent reallocation of water rights, actually account for 67% of all transactions, but just 13% of the water transferred. To put this in context, the cumulative volume of water transferred since 1987 amounts to about 10 times the annual flow of the Colorado River. This graphic shows the number and source of water transfers in the West. Agriculture is the source of the most transferred water, which is not surprising given that it accounts for approximately 80% of consumptive water use in the West. Agriculture to urban exchanges are among the most numerous, with 56% of transfers and 18% of all water transferred. Urban to environmental and combination exchanges also involve considerable amounts of water. A couple of states are responsible for most water transfers in the West. Arizona accounts for 53% of agriculture to agriculture and 58% of urban to urban water transactions. California and Idaho dominate the agriculture to environmental category. Water transfers are relatively rare in Montana, Nevada, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming, regardless of the transfer classification. Another often mentioned solution to the West water dilemma is desalination of seawater. In this chart we see that the cumulative total of global desalination capacity has been steadily rising over the past two decades. New desalination plants are also being proposed and built along the California coast. This graphic shows what was proposed in 2006, but not all of these plants have been built. While the capacity of desalination plants continues to grow, this water supply solution is an expensive one, mainly due to its high energy consumption. All of our major water sources require some amount of energy, but desalination is typically at the top of the list when it comes to energy intensity. As an example, this graphic illustrates the energy requirements of the water supply options facing San Diego County. Seawater desalination would require even more energy than moving water hundreds of miles from the San Francisco Bay Delta to Southern California. There are also major concerns related to the disposal of the reject brine stream and the impact of desalination on marine and coastal ecosystems. But because freshwater is so limited in the West, some communities along the coast feel they have no choice but to explore desalination. Let's review some of the main points in this presentation. A limited and unpredictable water supply is one of the defining features of the American West, which is facing a water crisis that is being compounded by growth and climate change. Climate change is expected to make the Southwest even drier and shrink the snowpack in many locations, causing problems for water managers and freshwater ecosystems. 
Overall, we're becoming more efficient in our water use, but total demand continues to rise along with the region's growing population and energy use. Although water quality has generally improved, our water infrastructure is crumbling in the West and across the nation. Looking ahead, water conservation, water reuse, expanded water markets, and desalination are likely to play a role in addressing the challenge of water in the West. Thanks for watching this presentation. You can download it, as well as other slides and entire libraries, at ecowest.org. A number of leading experts on Western conservation serve as advisors to EcoWest. EcoWest is produced by California Environmental Associates. Please feel free to contact us if you have a question or want to make a suggestion.